don't only want to have patients here, no relatives. No, they like they learn to live with it. Uh, so, and they're very disciplined. They all come, they're all wearing masks. Uh, it's an issue because we don't have that many masks in Canada. Yeah, it's, it's, I think in Egypt, we are, uh, we are reopening now, Ashraf, as you see. And yeah. then we have reached like uh, 50 to 65% of the pre-COVID uh, era, yes. And yes, I like that the comment that the patients now are obeying the rules. And I think we will continue like that of uh, putting the masks and limiting the number uh, of persons in the examination room. It's, it's nicely accepted without any kind of humiliation, yes? Yes, this, I think it will uh, don't continue. I think it is in the end of this year like this. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I'm afraid to be hello about that. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Yasser, how are you? Hello, how are you? Hi, how are you? You're fine. Uh, Dr. Thank you very much. Dr. Sidi, how are you? He's still not. So everyone is here. So, Ashraf, are you going to start the, the cataract first and then you finish the cataract and then we go on to the glaucoma, yes? That's the plan? I think so. I, I think so, yes. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. So, and how, Ashraf, how is the mood in Egypt? How do people fear? What are their feelings in the corona times? Uh, I can say that uh, patients going to, going out, going out, uh, little, uh, not so much fear, but uh, the patient number uh, is starting to be increasing since the last week. Mm. Uh, some of them uh, obeying the rules uh, of protection and, uh, and, and a lot of people not obeying the rules. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the hospitals uh, now uh, giving the most um, uh, the most suitable uh, protection for the patient. Most of the hospital now, uh, so uh, giving the patient the feel that uh, the hospitals are uh, secure for them. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, but uh, in the in the country, we are going to open. I think in a couple of two weeks, mm -hmm. uh, slowly, but we are going to open. Mm -hmm. uh, hope it does not uh, increase because I. I, I, I heard the, uh, since two days in Germany, when you open the country, I think the case is starting to increase. Yes. No, funny why it's not. Yesterday, usually we had 1,000 new infections every day, and yes. yesterday it was only 374. So it dropped. Uh, uh, and how, I hope it will continue like that because uh, many countries in uh, Europe, and I mean Egypt as well, they really depend on tourism. Like my, yeah. my parents very often go to Egypt. Uh, I will go to the south of France uh, the last two weeks of June uh, and it will be able again because at the Mediterranean they didn't have uh, so much infections. Um, so it looks like I will be able to spend the last two weeks of June in the south of France. Okay. I hope the, 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 the tra tra traveling uh, started. Air France and Emirates, they say that they are, they are going to open in the couple of weeks, starting reservation, I know, but I hope it can go to trouble. Well, the ticket prices will be acceptable or? The, the prices and the, uh, the instructions, because uh, they are taking the rules that uh, they are going to leave a chair, uh, clear chair between uh, yes. people, traveling economy or in uh, in uh, business class. So this is for sure going to increase the yes. the price of the ticket. Yes, sure, sure. Yeah. So, Doctor CD, how are you? You you hear me? I'm fine, and you? Uh, I'm fine too. Thank, thanks for well, that. We are starting in a few minutes, maybe in uh, two minutes. Okay. So we are going to start uh, the cataract uh, session. We are going to start the cataract session first, then the glaucoma. Uh, first, so two uh, cases of uh, cataract, and uh, after that, uh, two cases of uh, glaucoma cases. Okay. So two they are by going two. To, to two by two. Have it two by two. Okay. Right.
Everyone, it's it's uh, it's fine in uh, in the panel. Yes. 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 <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> nice to, to to meet you, Nancy. Yes, nice. Pleasure. To me. To it's a pleasure to be among all of you. Yes. Really. Thank you. Yes. I I think this is the the rarest webinar that uh, contains the cataract and glaucoma surgery in yes. a video based session. Yeah. This is really to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hello, Dr. Omni. How are you? Hello. Hi, how are you, Dr. Ahmed? I'm fine, thank you. And you? Alhamdulillah, how are you, everyone? Yes. Uh, hi, how are you? Great, yes. yes. Hi, Dr. Omni. Hi, hi, everyone. Hi, how are you, Dr. Nancy? Nice to meet all of you, thank you. Nice to meet you, Dr. Omni. So I think there is still four uh, four speakers not here or three. Uh, exactly yes. Yes. So we will start in in one minute. Can I say something? I think Dr. Yasser should sit in between the light behind him and the screen. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. Come closer. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I will ask for me. I wear a mask as uh, I am with uh, with technician here in uh, in this uh, room. And uh, <laughs> yes, I, I I noticed this, and all the technicians are wearing the mask. Uh, you want my my face? <laughs> and the boss as well. <laughs> 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 Doctor Zahiri, I didn't recognize your face. Hi, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> So this is the new look for the COVID era. Uh, yes. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Sure. For, for, maybe for, for, for a long time. Yes. Uh, so it's, 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 so it's, we, it's we time start, now. Uh, right now? Yeah, it's, it's time now. Yeah. It's 3 p.m. Yeah. Let's go. Good evening, uh, everyone. Thanks for joining us and welcome to this uh, special live webinar on challenging cataracts and, uh, and glaucoma cases. Thanks to uh, Sotema, this is a, a big Moroccan laboratory, uh, for his valuable support. I am pleased to welcome all our experts, speakers, and panelists from 10 countries around the world. Great to be with all of you today. I would like to thank my friend Ashraf Armia for his involvement uh, in the organization of this webinar. He is a consultant cataract and refractive surgeon, uh, anterior segment reconstru uh, reconstruction in Cairo, Egypt. Thank you, Ashraf. Thank you. I call uh, Ashraf to start this webinar, to open this webinar. Uh, thank you, Sidi, and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, 
I uh, am pleased uh, to uh, moderate the CAT session uh, with uh, Dr. C. He is going to moderate the glaucoma session. Uh, we are uh, now live for everyone. Uh, we have uh, registration for more than 1,000, I think, now. So uh, everyone is uh, watching us now on YouTube live. So uh, we are going to start the cataract session. Uh, the videos, it's like a show. We are just going to start the videos and we are going to have some questions uh, related to the video and some discussions uh, about the decision making, why he chose or she chose this way in dealing the case. Okay, so uh, it's my pleasure uh, to uh, give the talk first to uh, Dr. Vitiv. Uh, uh, prayer from Germany. Uh, I'm so happy that uh, he, he joined us today. He's going to present a very interesting case. He's giving the topic is hunting for the best in refractive lens exchange. Uh, can you share your screen, Dr. Bray? Um, thank you very much uh, for having me. Uh, it's a real pleasure. Um, that you invited me to this very interesting session. So, and when you called me, I, I was still in bed and I saw your messaging and you asked me for complications in cataract surgery. And then I was thinking about the, the complications uh, all of us have as cataract refractive surgeons, that means unhappy patients. Um, and we have to explant multifocal IRLs again uh, because there was not the right select of IRL. But this was bothering me for many years and surely not only me but a lot of our colleagues uh, those spend a lot of their time or explanting multifocal IRLs. So I hope uh, this video which was uh, awarded at the ECRS meeting is not known to everybody of you. I'm not going to bore you. So we will start the uh, video right now. Do you do you see the video? Can we start it? No, I can't see not the yet. video now. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Binocular. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, I, we don't have. Uh, Just click on on sharing screen. Sharing screen. Okay. And select your video. Ah, okay. No, uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thank you. So. For example, um, this was one of the, my challenging cases uh, when a hunter came to see me and he wanted uh, to have multifocal vision. But as we all know, can you speak up, Yeah, okay, good. As we all know, hunters um, they have to hunt in dusk and dawn. That means they don't like uh, loss of contrast sensitivity. So you can't give binocular me vision lenses. with segmental multifocal intraocular lenses by Detlef Breyer, Hakan Kaimak, Karsten Klaber, Philip Hagen, Florian Kretz, and Gerd Alfart. Why do we need a new MIOL formula? The disadvantages of bifocal IOL, such as halo and glare, and no clear intermediate vision, caused 4% unhappy patients and 1% explantations. In contrast to that, the features of trifocal IOL are less halo and glare and clear intermediate vision. But these are accompanied by some disadvantages, such as less contrast sensitivity and reading only in good lighting conditions. Anyway, the patient acceptance of trifocal IOL is higher since clear intermediate vision and less halo and glare are crucial for many patients. In 2013, Dr. Breyer moderated the Asia Pacific Association of Cataract and Refractive Surgeons in Singapore, where Dan Reinstein presented his Presbyon laser blended vision concept as an innovative treatment of presbyopia. Here, the dominant eye is corrected for distance vision to almost plano, whereas the non-dominant eye is corrected to be slightly myopic for near vision to minus 1.5 diopters with a spherical optic resulting in a blend zone of vision. 
This inspired us to adopt the concept with segmental MIOL for extended depth of focus as a new treatment option for presbyopia and cataracts. We developed a new formula that offers comfort emetropic vision or comfort blended vision according to the individual patient's needs with Lentus Comfort and Lentus M plus X. And this is how it works. Near additions and target refractions are combined in different variants. As a tribute to our hometown, we called it the Düsseldorf formula. To achieve comfort emetropic vision, we implanted Lentus Comfort in both eyes with emetropia as target refraction. For comfort blended vision, we choose Lentus Comfort with a near addition, for example, minus 1.5 diopters in the non-dominant eye, or Comfort M plus X with the Lentus M plus X in the non-dominant eye, according to the individual patient's needs. In 2014, we presented our new formula at ISOP and ESCRS in London. Defocus curves generated from clinical data and the knowledge of multifocal MIOL capacities are indispensable in meeting patients' differing needs. One year later, at the next meetings in Barcelona, we presented our first clinically significant scientific results. The strength of halo and glare was defined as the geometric mean of size and intensity and subdivided into four categories, none, mild, moderate, and severe. We could show that the Düsseldorf formula demonstrated excellent visual results in far, intermediate, and near, with very few photopic phenomena comparable to our employees aged between 16 and 60. In 2016, at the German meeting of cataract and refractive surgeons in Mannheim, and at a congress of the University of Heidelberg, we presented our latest findings. In the cause of our quality management with MIOL, we investigated the influence of the optical design, near addition, and target refraction of MIOL on photopic phenomena. The results confirmed our expectations. In diffractive optics, higher near addition and deviation from emetropia correspond with stronger halo and glare. Refractive optics overall have higher tolerance regarding photopic phenomena compared to diffractive IOL. Preoperative evaluation. True corneal shape analysis and measurement of total corneal astigmatism with the LED Cassini. Examination with a corneal aberometer. Surgery. The corneal refractive information of the Cassini is wirelessly sent to the laser. The iris registration enables us to find the true axis of astigmatism and mark it with the laser. This video shows the implantation of the Oculentus Comfort Toric MF15. Alignment of the toric IOL markings and the corneal marks for perfect IOL orientation. One month after the second surgery. So far. So, 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 so now we have one month after surgery. You did have a little time to get used to the new. Uh, vision I hope. Are you happy with the results? Very happy. Very happy, that sounds good. <laughs> so very happy means that your far vision, intermediate vision and near vision is fine, uh, despite small print reading. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely correct. Where would you think or find yourself in the maximum, medium or minimum? Medium. Uh, medium, okay, perfect. Okay, I hope that was a little bit as interesting for everybody, or at least one. <laughs> so, thank you so much for your presentation.
Uh, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Yeah, thank you so much for your presentation, uh, uh, this leap. Uh, uh, so you, you think that refractive lens exchange uh, is a good option when you use a, a multifocal or trifocal IOL? Um, yes, I do. But I think you clearly, and I wanted to make it understandable with a video, you have to talk to the patient and individualize uh, multifocal eye surgery. Because if you do the Düsseldorf formula, you will not be able to read small print, but you have nearly no halo and glare. But there are also people who walk, say, okay, photopic phenomena, it's not a problem, but I want to read small print. So the, the most important thing is a visual history of our patients, and then we adapt the lenses. And what is also a little bit nice uh, with the Düsseldorf formula, uh, you can still, if the patient says, I want to have a little bit more far or uh, near vision, if you are further away from hemetropia or where you or your target refraction, you can still do a touch up procedure with uh, laser vision correction. So it makes it easy to correct this even later on in contrast. If somebody doesn't like a diffractive trifocal lens, that's it. If he doesn't get around with halo and glare and vexy vision, he has a problem. And here you can still adjust later on, even with a touch-up procedure. What do you, what do you think about very focal uh, LASIK, LASIK surgery or multifocal? Um, I personally, I am a really big fan of press beyond laser vision correction. And I, I, I just bought a Schwind laser because I also think the Presby Max is a very interesting, good idea. And I do like solutions. If the patient wouldn't be happy, you can go back to zero with, a, with easy surgery. I think there, that there, you always have the possibility of a way out if the patient is unhappy, because sometimes you lose the patients, they come back after six months, another doctor has done yeah, capsulotomy, and somebody implanted a trifocal IOL. And then you have to explode it, uh, and that's that's no fun. So, they, so did you stop implanting diffractive IOL? Uh, no, because as I said before, I really think there are enough patients. And for example, let's take my population. I implant ninety percent EDOF or trifocal IOLs, and forty percent of them uh, want trifocal IOLs even they know they have photopic phenomena. They just don't care about it. So everybody of us is different. He has a different hobby, uh, different uh, business duties. So I th think what we have to do as doctors, listen to our patients and then adapt the refractive uh, IOL-based laser surgery to their needs and always put the disadvantages in front. So what I tell my patients first are the disadvantages of what I'm going to do. And then I look at their faces. If they if they are like, oh, 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 I don't like it, then I don't do it. What a, what about corneal uh, halos uh, or uh, the corneal abrasion uh, before you implant a diffractive or uh, multifocal IOL? Do you? Um, I don't want to have it above 0.3. That's for me. Is it? I I don't care uh, to do after a LASIK procedure trifocal IOL. If uh, the aberrations are not above uh, 0.3, I think it's not a problem. If you have a nice optical zone, I do that and I have a lot of happy patients. Just yesterday there was one. And a very good friend of mine, she came from Munich, uh, same thing. Many doctors said, oh, no, you can't implant the cities, right? You don't only have 0.2 corneal aberrations, then I, I implant a trifocal either. Thank you so much, uh, Dietlieb. Uh, and uh, sure. sorry, a lot of questions you are going to be with us till you go to the your operation thank you so much uh, can i can i comment a little uh, bit here yes looking yes uh, yeah. regarding the uh, Dusseldorf formula i think it's a perfect uh, way to approach the patient needs in my practice we also uh, uh, used a lot of focal length is uh, uh, iols and we find that uh, as stated in the video uh, m plus x uh, combined with uh, uh, Lentis Comfort is uh, a little bit, uh, there are, um, the intermediate vision somehow is not uh, really good. 
we we uh, we used to uh, when we have uh, hyperopic patients we combine m plus x with mf20 uh, but we really pay attention to the angle kappa or uh, uh, the visual axis because m plus x is really sensitive about that and uh, vice versa in uh, um, in uh, myopic patients we tend to go with uh, two m plus x IOLs because they are uh, really good in near vision and frankly the myops are not care so much to, for their far vision. What are your uh, observations, Dr. Breyer, about that? Uh, I'm, I'm absolutely with you what you're saying. Uh, we just stuck the M plus X due to the reason when, because I think some of them, they have a really high coma as photopic phenomena. So then I experienced, I love to combine, for example, in the dominant eye, the LARA, which is a, uh, the EDOF mm -hmm. diffractive, within the non-dominant eye, uh, the trifocal uh, LISA. Because those phenomena, to me, seem a little bit more calculable, like the M plus X. But when I'm traveling through the world and I'm talking to different um, distributors, it's really interesting how in one country the M plus X is the best and it is planted like a monofocal and in other countries it's not accepted. This is very funny. I can't really tell you why, but what you said about the NCAPA, uh, how to deal with it and about the myops, I completely agree. I just personally uh, don't get around with the M plus X, then I prefer diffractive. But that's my personal thing. This has nothing to do with another country, uh, just my personal experience with my patients. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so now we are going to move uh, to another uh, very interesting uh, topic by Dr. Nancy Rakat from uh, Jordan. I'm going to choose this now. Uh, she's going uh, to tell us uh, about uh, small eye. It's a big problem in cataract. You must think twice. Dr. Nancy, uh, can, you uh, can, can you be with us? Yes, thank you, Asha, for the presentation. Um, uh, Dr. Nancy is the eminent uh, cataract surgeon in Jordan, uh, so uh, we are happy that we have you with us. Uh, thank you very much. This is an honor, Asha Freire. So, uh, can you see my screen now, or? Not yet. No, not, not yet. yet. Uh, hold on. Just. That's okay. Can you see the movie now? Okay, um, I will be talking about um, cataract surgery in uh, nanophthalmic eyes. And I think we're moving from a, a, a very broad spectrum. You, you moved us, Asha, from uh, multifocal uh, premium surgery to uh, this uh, procedure. Um, through the video, you will see uh, how straightforward it would look to, to the viewers. Uh, but allow me to comment uh, through the video on uh, how we faced obstacles until we came out with the best uh, outcome. So I had uh, uh, three siblings, six eyes, with a nanophthalmus eye. Um, the exit length was 13 in all of them. So you can imagine uh, uh, you could just poke the eye with a, uh, with a, 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 a very uh, trivial punch. Uh, the corneal diameter was uh, uh, 9 millimeter, as you can see, uh, and the intraocular uh, uh, lens power was 62 in one eye and 60 in the other eye. Uh, we discussed with the patient the refractive outcome because IOL power calculation um, is never uh, predictable. Uh, uh, we also uh, discussed the risks because this is a very small eye. As you can see, I poke the eye in order to be able to reach it. Uh, my uh, tip of finger is larger than the, the globe, uh, if you can see. And uh, we proceeded with the FACO. Uh, the patient took Manitoul and Diamox before surgery in order to decrease the pressure uh, coming from the vitreous. And then we proceeded with the surgery. Uh, I'm not going to say a lot. Uh, I just want the uh, uh, video, although we were on our nerves during the procedure. Um, I tend to do my Rex's. Uh, uh, on the small uh, uh, 
something happens, I always use the anterior capsule, which is sufficient enough. So this is a small rexus that I used to perform. And because his young um, aspiration was just so easy. His vision was counting finger three meter, by the way. So I just aspirated the, the lens. And this was the first eye of the six eyes I've done. Uh, and I learned something before. So in the, in the, in the next eyes, so not to uh, remove my uh, two instruments or two hands from the AC and allow it uh, so quickly like this. So this is something I wouldn't do again. Um, inject a lot of viscoelastic before you draw your second instrument or your second uh, uh, piece of uh, instrument you're using inside the eye. So yeah, this is, I'm doing this again but I was saved by a lot of prayers. I was quick, so not to allow any uh, complications to happen. And there's a very big list of complications that would happen with these patients. Uh, please ask me about it when we finish, Ashraf. So this is the lens, mm -hmm. it's a very customizable lens. It's a CT Extreme D from uh, Carl Zeiss. And uh, it's a very thick lens. You can see me struggling in uh, tucking it in the injector. And I want to show you without editing how we struggled to tuck it in. Um, and you see three loops, and it's not a multifocal lens, it's only a monofocal lens, but because it has a very high power, uh, it is incremented in three loops. And it's only a six millimeter in diameter. You can see it's half the, uh, almost half the normal uh, IOL, or the, the usual IOL. And uh, one, trick injected slowly uh, outside a little bit uh, because it's very thick, it gets st stuck in the injector. So you have to be, uh, you have to use a lot of viscoelastic and uh, try it. Uh, fully, uh, because the rate of posterior capsular rupture is, is high in these patients. I inject half of it uh, in the bag and the other half, I tuck it in with my Sinsky hook. It's a thick, small lens. Um, and voila. This is an uncomplicated surgery uh, with lots of preparation, lots of prayers, uh, lots of struggling, lots of patient counseling, uh, uh, and lots of things to learn about uh, 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 how close to uh, uh, being complicated these eyes are. And thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Nancy. This is a very interesting case, but I have a lot of questions, really. Uh, I, I know you uh, will. This type of, yeah, this type of lens... Uh, uh, what is the size of your anterior rexus you are going to do? The size of the rexus is 5 to 5.5 5 millimeter. Um, I t the eye is small. Uh, the cornea diameter is 9. So tend to do a smaller rexus than usual uh, for many reasons. The first thing is that you don't have to, it's, it's still in front of your eye. It doesn't uh, tear out whatsoever, uh, especially that these are young patients. The second thing is that the lens is a, a small lens, and so you, you capture it uh, with having uh, the, the uh, size of the rexus covering it all, uh, all over. And even if you have like a posterior push from the vitreous, having a small rexus with a, uh, the lens, even if you put a heel on a, 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 a heavy heel on or an OVD uh, inside, you can push the vitreous uh, 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 in a good way uh, during the surgery. Uh, another question, why you choose this uh, procedure? Why you didn't do a piggyback uh, IOL? Because if you have, if you uh, post-operative, if you have a refractive surprise, 
you can remove the second IOL and you can uh, change it because this is one uh, uh, one IOL. Also, why you didn't do a posterior excess with the anterior vitrectomy and you did a capture of the of the first lens uh, away in the uh, like a posterior uh, capture. Okay, so uh, I'll start from the last question. Now, these patients are uh, um, at a very high risk of having malignant glaucoma. So one of the recommendations is to do uh, a limited anterior vitrecti uh, uh, posterior vitrectomy. Um, the instruments were not available at the time, and I, uh, I felt safe giving Manitoul and, and Diamox uh, before surgery. So I was, I was playing it safe, uh, although the, uh, the, uh, I had that in mind in, in, in uh, subsequent procedure, but I never had to use it on all the six eyes. Um, this is one thing. The, the other thing, uh, but if you're if you're happy, the second thing is um, piggybacking. This eye is very small. That the axial length is thirteen, and the AC depth is two point two. There's no way I could piggyback, uh, 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 put a lens or uh, and add a lens uh, afterwards. I would do this in eyes with 35, 36 diopter IOLs. With uh, an exit length of 80 and 20, I would think of this. And, and we had a patient like a few days ago who had a 30, uh, 40 diopter IOL. We inserted the 35 uh, uh, diopter lens and, and left the rest to do uh, something about it when she comes uh, next week for a refraction. We either do a LASIK surface ablation to accommodate the, the residual error or a piggyback IOL. But an eye like this with a 13 millimeter all in all, um, I wouldn't think, except of the CT extreme from Zeiss. Uh, and what, which formula you used when you choose the IOL power in this very small eyes? Yeah, um, IOL formulas um, are very unpredictable in nanophthalmic eyes. They're not only microphthalmic, they are nanophthalmic. And uh, you have to be able to discuss with the patient that, that would there would be a possibility of a refractive outcome, uh, a surprise or a problem. Uh, and uh, so... Uh, what I prefer to do is take more than one uh, formula, more than one measurement, and compare them. Now, the best till now is the Barrett 2 universal formula uh, that gives you the, the, the best predictive outcome with a very uh, low margin of error uh, of 0.2, only 0.2 margin of error. Uh, the other formulas, uh, which is the best in, 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 a, in a row, comes the Hages uh, formula and the uh, Hover Q, but they give you a, a wide margin of uh, error, actually, up to 0.6. So, um, but all in all, never use the traditional SRK2 or SRKT. Uh, they do the worst in, in these very short eyes. Thank you, Nancy, so much. Uh, I'm going to move now to the glaucoma session moderated by CD. He's going to present two cases. So, uh, the, the wave with you now, uh, CD. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, um, the next uh, uh, speaker is uh, Alain Brown from uh, France. Do you hear me, Alain Brown? Yeah, yes, I see you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to share so, our so colleague. You, 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 you will. Uh, Alain is going to share with us a video on landmarks in deep sclerectomy. Very interesting uh, video, I, I'm sure. Thank you. You are uh, so bad. bad. Shukran. Shukran. Uh, so I, I'm going to share my, my screen. And yes. Here in Zoom. Okay. Voila. Perfect. I think now you have my screen, am I correct? Yes, perfect. Okay, okay, thank you. So, uh, um, for, for uh, even for experienced surgeons, uh, we need landmark when we are doing surgery, whatever surgery. I did su uh, refractive surgery when I was younger, it's exactly the same. Uh, and uh, that's my disclosure statement. And uh, sometimes I, I found this cartoon for you, my friends. You can be lost in the desert or elsewhere. And when you are dissecting your different planes during your surgery, again, even though you have a strong experience, you can be lost. So you need some flags. You need landmarks which cannot be contested. You, you, you need to be sure where you are. 
And for glaucoma surgery, whatever the surgery, it could be deep sclerectomy, it could be trabeculectomy, viscocanalostomy, your best friend is the scleral spur. And let's see a, a, a video of a, a, a video running well, I would say. So uh, personally, I, I, I've been taught by my Swiss friends and colleagues, André Mermou, Gordana, Tarek, and uh, that's a dissection of, of the first flap. You, you, you know that I'm doing surgery, most often under topical surgery with a silocaine injection. And you have to find the good planes of dissection. And when you are in the good pl plans, it's okay. It's when your GPS is working, you know, you go directly to the right address. And here, the main landmark is this white. You know, this white is very special. It's the white of the scleral spur. It's like the, the white in a pearl. It's different from the, the other white of the scleral because you have no pigment inside. That's the dissection of the second uh, flap, which is for beginners difficult, but here you can see the difference in the color. When you see this gray color, uh, uh, you can be sure to, to be deep. On here, you, you can see this bright white. I guess you, you can see, pardon me, here. It's very obvious. And this is a scleral spur. So like that, you can go Anteriorly, it's exactly the same planes that corneal surgeons are using for uh, the new surgery, like this AEK, the MEK. And here, the, the last landmark is the removal of this small layer, 15, 20 microns, with special forceps, the pneumon number five, which is the trabeculum, the cribriform uh, trabeculum or juxta canalicular uh, meshwork which uh, offers 80% resistance to aqueous outflow. And like André taught me, you need to perform a large window. But of course, we are showing the best case like uh, plasticians, but unfortunately, it's not always like that. This is another video. I'm doing the surgery, it's not a resident. And this day, I don't know why, uh, patient difficult, I was not in good shape. I have to, I have some difficulties to know really where I am. And I'm a bit anxious about this. Um, you can see here, I, I see a, a radial vessel. You can see the red of the radial vessel. It's a high magnification, so of course it's very moving. And here, what I thought, I thought it was the beginning of the cornea, but actually not at all. It's the ciliary body, as you can see here. So I have opened the sclera. I'm within uh, the UVA, it's very bad situation. And in this case, I try to find where is my good friend. And my good friend, again, is the scleral spur. And you have to imagine the scleral spur as a sort of ring, you know. Uh, 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 in the past, I did also some keratoplasties and were using uh, steel rings around the eye to maintain the shape. It's exactly here. Unfortunately, I was able to find the sterile spur here. And now I, I could clearly see here the juxta canalicular meshwork. You can really see it here. I hope you are seeing, uh, the, generally speaking, Zoom is pretty good for videos. And with a special forceps, I was using the ruby knife, which was taught to me by André Mermou as well, to have a smooth dissection very anterior, because if you have to do further goniopuncture, it's much easier without incarceration of the iris. And you can see the percolation of aqueous humor uh, through the cornea. You can see here the vessel very clearly. You can see the effraction within the uvea, but which is not damageful to the patient. Here, unfortunately, I have damaged uh, uh, partly the scleral spur. And at the end, I'm removing the juxta canalicular meshwork which is really the success of deep sclerectomy. Otherwise, it does not work. So that was two short videos to tell you that when you are doing surgery, uh, um, uh, you need to be in the good plan. It's true. But uh, uh, again, if you want to, to know, it's like on the road. Sometimes your GPS is going wrong, and you don't know where you are. So only the uh, uh, scleral spur can tell you what you are. And it's exactly the, uh, I, 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 I have added two, two slides just to end my presentation. 
you need to consider the anatomy of the angle from inside. We are used to that when we are performing gonioscopy. And to see exactly where you are, because some angles are difficult, difficult, you have to rely on this small white band, which is a special bright white, which is a scleral spur. You can see here in this pigmentary uh, 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 angle, here you have precisely the scleral spur. It's from inside, but you have to consider the same anatomy outside. And here, I have chosen a patient with an embryon toxone. You remember that the embryon toxone is an exaggeration of the Schwalm's line. So it's the anterior limit of the trabeculum, which is uh, approximately here in the scheme, here in li uh, on, on, on the live eye. And here you have the, the white, pardon me, the repetition, but this bright white uh, is very useful because, again, you know where you are. In front of the scleral spur, you have the trabeculum, and in this case, the juxta canaliculum work you have to remove. Here, the trabeculum, and here, um, the, the, the schwalm line. So, to conclude, uh, if you want to, to to operate properly, you know, you need to know the anatomy, the 3D anatomy, and also your good friends. And like that, you can rescue a surgery which was really, uh, uh, at the beginning, really uh, uh, bad. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Alan, for, for this uh, uh, nice video. Uh, the landmark. Marks in deep scleroectomy is uh, the scleral spur is a very important uh, landmark uh, for this surgery. Uh, I would like to to ask you about uh, um, about this uh, this section. Uh, when we uh, uh, the level of the dissection um, is uh, we you miss the 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 Schlenz canal. What do you do? You 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 dissect a, a third uh, slab, or you you go directly to the to, to the, the Schlenz canal. Yes, because uh, otherwise, if you you are not too deep, uh, uh, it will not work. So in this case, you have to dissect a third flap. I have also a video for that, but it's much more difficult, and you are more risk to perforate. That's why you have to rely on, on the deepness of the second flap to rely yeah. on the gray. I, I try to show you the, the nature of the gray. And when you, the sclera is much gray, that is a more superficial sclera, you are in the good plane. It's the uh, main mistake for beginners. Beginners are shy, of course, because they are afraid of perforating. But uh, uh, if, if it does occur, of course, you need to do a, a third a third flap, yeah. Yes, uh, of course, the, the, the second flap uh, must remove 90% uh, of the, the thickness of the sclera and let only uh, some fibers of uh, sclera uh, there. And uh, in the case if a small perforation, uh, what do you do? You you convert your your deep sclerectomy, your trabeculectomy, or you continue your your, your surgery as uh, uh, as usual. It depends on the magnitude of the perforation. If you have, a, for instance, it, it occurs mainly when you are performing combined surgery with cataract surgery, because in this case, with the pressure within the anterior chamber, you can have you really see a strong extrusion of the iris. In this case, it's very difficult, it's very boring situation. However, when you have a small perforation without incarceration of the iris, you continue the surgery and you, you, you should remove the juxta canaliculum mesh work. So it, it, it works only in small perforation. But when the perforation is too obvious, too wide, you need to uh, uh, remove an anterior part of the corneal, like in 